theoretical philosophy primarily concerns questions of fact, while normative philosophy primarily concerns questions of value. Moral philosophy, in particular, does not attempt to explain what is true or false and how we can come to know what is true and distinguish it from what is false. It offers insights into what ought and what ought not to be the case, not the things are not that things are or the way they are, but what they should be and what we as moral agents should and shouldn't do. In political philosophy, it raises questions about social values in law, government, public policy, and international relations. Disagreements about matters of value seem different than disagreements about matters of fact, both in number and in difficulty. The differences between theories of fact and value have discouraged some thinkers from supposing that they could ever be objective answers to moral and even political problems. We cannot simply calculate or perform laboratory experiments to solve moral problems as we can in problems of mathematics and of science. We can nevertheless apply the time-honored honored philosophical methods of following the best arguments to whatever conclusions they lead. We neither downplay nor overemphasize the impression that philosophical problems in metaphysics and epistemology often seem answerable with enough patience and ingenuity whereas controversies uh, about whether, say, cat capital punishment or abortion is morally permissible, whether democracy or aristocracy is a morally preferable form of government, and whether capitalism or socialism is a morally justifiable form of political economy, are problems of a different order and higher magnitude about which we can imagine long-standing oppositions that may never be resolved, that will always divide the opinions of philosophers and the moral attitudes and ethical conduct of persons in all walks of life. The difference between fact and value do not prevent philosophical inquiry in ethics and political philosophy from reaching worthwhile conclusions. They do, however, suggest that the modes of argument to be followed in normative philosophical disciplines are likely to be different in some ways than those we have found useful in metaphysics and epistemology. Aristotle, in his great work, The Nicomachean Ethics, maintains that we should not expect the same degree of precision in moral philosophy that we find in mathematics and natural science. The wisdom of this word of caution is easily appreciated by anyone who has pondered the problems of deeply rooted moral and political disputes. We shall consider Aristotle's advice as we prepare to begin the study of ethics and political philosophy. We shall continue to expect that philosophical methods of analysis and argument will remain the best way to understand philosophical problems of moral and political value. The issues here are among the most important and difficult questions for an integrated theoretical and normative philosophy. As Socrates reminds his friends discussing the nature of 
arete or virtue in Plato's dialogue, the Republic or Polytheia, the topics of moral and political philosophy deserve our high, greatest attention and care because they concern how we are to live. We can easily see why Socrates attaches such significance to the challenges of moral and political philosophy. What can be more important and therefore understandably more disputatious than philosophical problems about the nature of moral and political good? What we ought and ought not to do in living our lives? The sort of political and social arrangements by which human beings are best organized and governed, and that affect every other practical aspect of our existence. Our lives are not personally affected by whether or not Plato's forms exist, or whether the sensible properties of sensible things are supported by an underlying, insensible, and thinking material substratum, or as Berkeley argues, are mere conjuries of ideas. On the other hand, it makes a very tangible difference in our daily lives whether we decide that it is morally permissible or impermissible to steal or kill, or whether we believe that political institutions should be tolerant or intolerant of religious differences, discriminative or non-discriminative against persons because of their gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or lifestyle. For these are among the ways in which we and those we care about can be directly affected, in which the quality of our lives can be made better or worse for us, as individuals. We are now ready to address problems of moral and political value, beginning with Immanuel Kant's masterwork, the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, and I'm sure to murder this title, nevertheless it's worth mentioning, Grundlegung zur Metaphysik der Sitten, 1785. And turning thereafter, we'll try to look at philosophers of ethical and political value who agree or even disagree with Kant's approach. We shall try in this way to obtain a well-rounded perspective on the central questions of moral and political value from leading thinkers in the history of philosophy. Kant's philosophical method is an outgrowth of the difficulties encountered by the two major movements in the 17th and 18th centuries. Working during the middle and latter part of the 18th century, Kant is the premier representation of the German Enlightenment or, again, I'm going to murder this, of Clarung. His great treatise, the Critique of Pure Reason or, and murdering again, Critique der Reinen Vernunft, in which he describes a new method of philosophy, appeared in two editions in 1781 and in 1787. As Kant explains in his Prolegomena to any future metaphysics that can come forth as science, 1783, he was dissatisfied with both the rationalism that typified 17th century philosophy and the empiricism that characterized the earlier part of the 18th century. Kant, 
remarks that rationalism, as we find it in Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz, is dogmatic rather than scientific because it does not offer a repeatable method by which different rationalists claiming to follow the same method are likely to arrive at the same conclusions. In short, hindi madaling ulitin yung ginawa ni Descartes on his Spinoza, on Leibniz, where science with its procedures of hypotheses, testing, and refinement of hypotheses is not practiced, there Kant observes a thinker can only resort to dogma. Scientifically unsupported speculation and authoritative pronouncement in the pejorative sense of the word these qualities make rationalism unattractive to Kant. He also find, but he also finds empiricism in the forms articulated by Locke, Berkeley, and Hume also to be unsatisfactory for a different reason because it leads to skepticism. Kant observes that if we are going to limit philosophical knowledge to what can be experienced empirically in perception or constructed by reason, imagination, and memory from the contents of immediate sense experience, then many important philosophical propositions cannot be upheld. He has in mind here specifically beliefs in the necessity of causation and in the existence of material substance, both of which Berkeley denies, and the existence of person, self, or soul as a unified substantial subject of experience about which Hume in A Treatise of Human Nature 1739-1740 to raises very interesting doubts. All of these tenets of rationalist philosophy are disputed by empiricism because they cannot be directly experienced and are not constructible by the other faculties of mind from the data of perception. As a result, Kant finds modern philosophy caught between the two extremes of rationalist dogmatism and radically empiricist skepticism. To implement a new method of, for philosophy that will overcome the limitations of rationalism and empiricism, Kant proposes to make metaphysics scientific in a revolutionary way. The solution Kant offers to the impasse between rationalism and empiricism, and so between dogmatism and skepticism, has two parts, both of which he pursues in his theoretical and normative philosophical inquiries, which he refers to respectively as speculative, and practical philosophy. We are interested in Kant's ethics, but since to this point we have been considering problems of epistemology and metaphysics and are more familiar with its territory, it will be useful to begin by explaining Kant's scientific method in philosophy. First, with respect to theoretical or speculative philosophical topics, and then describe how the method is supposed to apply to practical philosophy in ethics and in politics.
let's look at Kant's metaphysics and understand it as a system of synthetic a priori propositions. Let me revert to the blackboard. Kant's philosophical method has two very important parts. One, the first task is to identify what specific kinds of judgments must philosophy establish or prove. Second, so Kant uh, expresses a surprise that such a basic question about the purpose of philosophy or what kinds of statements philosophy should be interested with has not been answered and was simply taken for granted. Second, he says, that it is the, his, uh, the second task he sets is to describe a way of discovering and justifying the particular kinds of judgment that philosophy aims. So, two goals. One, to identify the what specific kinds of judgments uh, philosophy should be interested with. Second, to describe a way of discovering and justifying the particular kinds of judgments that philosophy aims. Like, Many philosophers before him, no? Kant creates a distinction between what he calls a priori and eventually what people will call a posteriori. A priori and a posteriori propositions. An a priori proposition cannot be justified empirically by perception, whereas an a posteriori proposition can only be justified empirically by perception. If you didn't get that, since this is pre-recorded, please just try to replay that. Kant further distinguishes between analytic and synthetic propositions. Following an analogy with the division of labor in analytic and synthetic chemistry, Kant describes analytic judgments as predications of properties to subjects in which the concept of the property is already contained in the concept of the subject. An analytic judgment analyzes or breaks down the concept of a subject by unpacking its set of properties, some of which or all of which are then attributed to the subject in a proposition that cannot fail to be true. An example of an analytic judgment is that gumamela is a flower, where the property of being a flower is already contained in the concept of gumamela. 
as part of its meaning or analysis. A better example is also red is a color. Let's explain what we mean by that. When we assert that red is a color according to Kant, we are only putting together a subject with a predicate that already belongs to the subject. The property of being a color is not something that we need to add to the concept red in order to judge that red is a color. Because red is defined as a particular color or range of colors. Whereas analytic statements involve predications in which the concept of the predicate is contained in the concept of the subject, synthetic propositions are non-analytic assertions in which a predicate that is not part of the analyzed subject is added to, put together, or literally synthesized with, concept, with the concept of the subject. Thus, to add that blood is red is synthetic. The concept of blood does not contain in its analysis the concept of being red. Instead, the predicate red is added to or combined synthetically with the concept of blood in order to assert that blood is red. Kant considers the possibility of analytic a priori, synthetic a posteriori, and Synthetic a priori propositions. So now we can look at the table in front of us and we'll see that in each of these cases, Kant will provide an example. So take note though that I did say that Kant considered the existence of an of a very few sets, you know, uh, analytic a priori. Yes, he thinks that there is such a thing. Synthetic a posteriori. Yes, there's such a thing. In fact, when you look at their definitions, if it's analytic, it's always a priori. If it's synthetic, it's always a posteriori. But Kant will also speak of a synthetic a priori propositions. For Kant, there cannot be such a thing as an analytic a posteriori. There can be no analytic a posteriori propositions. So this category is empty and even eliminable. An analytic a posteriori proposition would be a proposition in which the concept of the predicate was already contained in the concept of the subject, but which required sense experience in order to be justified. Such a cross-section of judgment categories clearly does not make sense. Since if the concept of a predicate is already contained in the concept of the subject, then the predication does not require experience to be justified, but is justified when conceptual analysis reveals that the predicate is contained in the subject independently of experience. Analytic a priori and synthetic a posteriori judgments, as we've said a while ago, and these two, that I'm putting two check marks with again, are the most straightforward categories, the usual and even the expected combinations, in which an analytic proposition, true or false, is justified as such by conceptual analytic methods that do not involve an appeal to perception and 
in which a synthetic judgment, true or false, is justified by empirical evidence ultimately dependent on sense experience. The way we find out that blood is red, for example, is to observe a sample of blood under normal conditions. Of course, leaving aside the fact that an oxygenated venous as opposed to oxygenated arterial blood is dark blue. And see that it is red and to test its color by other reliable means. So we've already considered three. No? There are no analytic a posteriori, but the more straightforward if that is that if it's analytic, it's a priori. If it's synthetic, it's a posteriori. The remaining category, I will put a heart to, is that of synthetic a priori propositions. And this is the most interesting for Kant's purposes. Although it is standardly supposed that all analytic propositions are a priori and all synthetic propositions are a posteriori, Kant argues that synthetic a priori judgments is the appropriate category for the principles of philosophy, including, this is the text that we will look at, in the metaphysics of morals. So he says, he will say, if there's one thing that it is this type of statements that philosophy should be interested in. Synthetic a priori statements. That's, that's how it's called. The conclusion that there are synthetic a priori propositions is often regarded as one of Kant's most valuable philosophical discoveries. Kant believes that identifying the proper subject matter of judgments of philosophy as synthetic a priori is vital to establishing metaphysics as a science, including the metaphysics of morals, especially in opposition to dogmatism and skepticism. So uh, take note the differences. No? Uh, here, these are the realm of conceptual and defini definitional truths. This is the realm of natural science as we know it. These do not exist. And lastly, this is the realm of mathematics, and also of his metaphysics of science. And morals. To understand, however, what Kant intends by the category of the synthetic a priori judgments, it is useful, very useful, to begin with Kant's favorite example in mathematics. Kant explains the concept as it is applied to basic mathematical propositions. Seven plus five is equivalent to twelve. What makes the proposition seven plus five is equivalent to twelve a priori is perhaps obvious enough. The truths of mathematics do not require observation for their justification, even though we may learn about 
or otherwise acquire the knowledge that 7 plus 5 is equivalent to 12 through sense experience. Kant's innovation is in recognizing that 7 plus 5 is equivalent to 12 is synthetic rather than analytic. He argues that when we analyze the concept of 7 plus 5, we find nowhere concealed within it the concept of 12. If we construe the proposition as a predication in which the property of being equal to 12 is predicated of the subject 7 plus 5, then there are no grounds for thinking that the concept of 7 plus 5 contains the concept 12. We do not find the concept of 12 in the concept of 7 or the plus sign or 5 into which the concept 7 plus 5 is analyzed. Kant argues that all of mathematics is concerned with just such synthetic a priori propositions. And he maintains the same is true of the metaphysics of science and foundations of the metaphysics of morals. Metaphysics in the scientific mode to which Kant aspires is, con is concerned with the discovery of true synthetic a priori propositions. It is a tremendous advance, Kant believes, to have finally identified the proper subject matter of metaphysics. We thereby take an important first step toward making metaphysics scientific in the search for genuine metaphysical knowledge that stands opposed to both dogmatism and skepticism. Kant, in the Prolegomena, reports that it was reading Hume in particular and Hume's account of the empirical origin of the idea of causation that Kant says awakened him, awakened him from his dogmatic slumbers. By this, Kant means his previews and critical acceptance of rationalist doctrines concerning the logical necessity of causal connections advocated by Leibniz and the latter Leibnizian philosopher Christian Wolff. So we've already answered the first question or the first goal to identify what specific kinds of judgments or propositions philosophy should be interested in. And the answer to that is that it's interested with synthetic a priori statements. Having identified the problem, proper sphere of metaphysical inquiry and its purpose as the discovery of true synthetic a priori judgments of metaphysics, it remains for Kant to explain the exact method by which synthetic a priori principles are to be discovered. We now move to the second goal. To describe a way of discovering and justifying the particular kinds of judgments that philosophy aims. If we define the work of scientific metaphysics as justifying a system of science, synthetic a priori propositions, how does Kant propose to do it? What is a proper method of metaphysics by which synthetic a priori judgments can be recognized and confirmed? Here, Kant specifically speaks of a very unique way of moving forward, which he will eventually call transcendental methodology. Kant 
Kant outlines a transcendental methodology for metaphysics, and the method has a specific starting place and a specific question it asks. Together with a definitive way of trying to answer its questions, and verify the correctness of its answers. Transcendental reasoning in Kant's metaphysics is an effort to uncover synthetic a priori judgments that are presupposed by different types of propositions for present purposes in science and ethics and politics, but also in aesthetics and other areas of human knowledge. Metaphysics in the ordinary sense, as Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, or even Berkeley, among other thinkers in the pre-Kantian history of philosophy practice it, is for Kant an investigation of the most basic underlying assumptions or presuppositions of the sciences, which Kant describes as the transcendental ground. So Kant says, at the bottom of everything, there is a base. There is a transcendental ground. Kant's transcendental method begins with something that is given. And based on what is given, it asks the question, about something. And that's what he calls transcendental reasoning. I'll not type it anymore, but let's just put it as TR. So Kant's transcendental method begs the transcendental question, and this is the question, pay attention, what must be true in order for what is given even to be possible? Please replay the video if you didn't get that. The answer that is uncovered as a presupposition or ultimately underlying assumption of the given, if Kant is right, is a synthetic a priori proposition that is presupposed by knowledge, in this case of the relevant science. In the case of moral philosophy and Kant's excavation of the transcendental ground of morals, the given is, in fact, the ethical judgments we make for which the transcendental question can be what must be true in order for moral judgments to be possible. The given in Kant's metaphysics takes several forms depending on Kant's division of the project of metaphysics into a complex of related preliminary investigations. In the section on the transcendental aesthetic in the critique of pure reason, Kant begins with sense, especially visual experience of objects in space and time, and asks what must be true in order for our experience of such objects even to be possible. As part of his overall program in metaphysics, he takes as his starting place all of Newtonian science and identifies the purpose of metaphysics as uncovering the transcendental ground of a synthetic a priori proposition that must be true in order for the world of phenomena explained in the Newtonian science to be possible. 
the way in which we are supposed to recognize the synthetic a priori transcendental ground of science is by looking for and confirming conditions whose existence cannot be denied except on pain of contradiction with the given. Thus, if the given is G, let's go back to if the given is G, no, there, <coughs> excuse me, can't ask the transcendental question what must be true in order for G to be possible. Then the correct answer, the transcendental ground or the ultimate foundation of G, which we can call T there, T, will be the presupposition of G without which G would not be possible. The sign of the dependence of G on T is the fact that G is made impossible if T is not presupposed. Or that asserting G while denying T produces an outright logical contradiction. Then we can say that G is impossible in lieu of or without the truth or occurrence of T. Although Kant's transcendental reasoning in all its details is complicated to explain, a relatively good idea of Kant's method can be gathered from the fact that in the case of our visual experience in the transcendental aesthetic, Kant concludes that space and time are not external properties to be discovered in the world but space and time are rather pure forms of intuition which, with which thought must be innately pre-equipped and without which we could never experience the world as divided up into distinct objects, foreground and background and the like, as given to experience. If we did not already have spatiotemporal forms for the mind to impose on its experience of the phenomenal world, then we could never discover space and time in the external realm of sensation because we would not be capable in the first place of distinguishing objects as spatiotemporally discrete things separated from one another in what Kant calls the Manifold of experience. Manifold of experience. The world that would appear to us in that case when we opened our eyes would be nothing but a chaos with no definite spatial space and no possibility of mentally clacking whatever passes through consciousness in time as occurring at different times. What would that be like? It is unthinkable, unintelligible, and unconceivable for us even to imagine anything we would be prepared to recognize as experience, as Kant says, without shape or color and unaccompanied by any sense of the passing of time, in which we ordinarily live through a conscious stream of sequentially ordered thoughts and images. The experientiality of things in space and time, and in particular places in space, is a function of the perception of extended sensible things persisting or disappearing from moment to moment in thought. If we were not already pre-equipped with space and time as pure forms of intuitions, our mind would never be capable of discovering them in the meaninglessness, inarticulated flocks of experience, 
for which no sense of persistence or change, no places, sizes, or colored shape of things could possibly be discerned. Kant concludes that space and time do not exist externally in the world of objective facts to be experienced by a thinking subject but belong to the thinking subject's built-in experiential apparatus. Categories of the mind, as we are always taught. Space and time, as pure forms of intuition, are, among the transcendental grounds of sense experience according to Kant, and by implication, constitute part of the speculative Metaphysics of Newtonian science. A similar mode of reasoning appear in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. In order to uncover synthetic a priori propositions that constitutes the transcendental ground of moral judgment. The conceptual foundations of ethical reasoning provide an answer to the transcendental question Kant poses with respect to the presuppositions of moral judgment. What must be true in order for moral judgments to be possible? The complicated answer to this question is the subject of the entire discussion on Kant's groundwork as we try to delve and earth Kant's transcendental foundations of the metaphysics of morals. The given for Kant's transcendental method in investigating the metaphysics of morals is the fact that we make moral judgments and that we make sense, whether morally right or wrong, when we do. Therefore, we need to ask ourselves, what must be true in order for these judgments to be possible? What synthetic a priori principles constitute the conceptual foundations of morality? And what implications, if any, they have for ethical theory and the practical conduct of our moral lives? If we adhere to the correct principles of moral philosophy, Kant proposes to explain as the transcendental ground of morality. We have explained Kant's understanding of metaphysics as a system of synthetic a priori propositions we have looked at his understanding of metaphysics as the transcendental ground of the given, both of which corresponds to number one or number two. But we've also looked at Kant's objections to rationalism and to empiricism. Now, we are ready to look into the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. There is a very special, there is a text that I'm going to use. And uh, if you're interested to know it, I'm re really going to use uh just a minute because i'm trying to look for the text the cambridge edition to the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals and i've seen it already give me time to post it for you to see so this is the text that i'm going to use this is the uh, Immanuel Kant's Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, 
and it's from the Cambridge text in the history of philosophy. And uh, this is the text that I will use and comment on. It's translated and edited by Mary Gregor. Uh, I only have an electronic copy, but we will look at all of these and you'd see how exciting it will be. I hope you're excited. Uh, and as Father Roque would say, Tara, lundagin mo, baby. If you like this recording, please subscribe, click or share this recording. Thank you very much. This is Samot Sari sa Simula. <laughs>